I'm Olivia Clementine, and this is Love and Liberation. Today, our guest is Cynthia Jors. Cynthia became a Dharma teacher in the Order of Interbeing of Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh in 1994, and in 2018 was made an honorary Lama in the Vajrayana tradition of Tibetan Buddhism in recognition of her dedication in carrying out the Earth Treasure Vase practice. Inspired by 30 years of pilgrimage into diverse communities and ecosystems, today Cynthia is forging a new path of Dharma in service to Gaia, a path deeply rooted in the feminine, honoring indigenous cultures, and devoted to collective awakening. Cynthia leads meditations, retreats, courses, and pilgrimages to support the emergence of a global community of engaged and embodied sacred activists. She lives at the foot of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains in northern New Mexico, where she is often found walking in the wilderness with her dog or gardening with her husband. Today, we'll be exploring her new book, Summoned by the Earth, Becoming a Holy Vessel for Healing Our World. This is our second interview with Cynthia. You can visit the show notes for our first interview together. Your book is so beautiful, Summoned by the Earth, Becoming a Holy Vessel for Healing Our World. I received it right before going to Nepal. So I read your book on the plane and it was so perfect because, you know, that flight is very long and your book starts in Nepal. So I felt like I was really beginning my journey with you. And this book is, I guess I would say like fecund in engrossing, juicy, but also amazing wisdom transmissions. And I can just see how much you gave to write this. Like you really gave yourself, you share so vulnerably and so insightfully. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Olivia. It's, it's all true what you say. And um, it touches me that you, you know, have received it in the way that you have. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to delving in. And I just want to encourage a listener right now to listen to our first conversation as well, because if there's some bits we don't cover today, that we really go into a lot in our first conversation. So, yeah. um, so let's start in the early 90s. So in the early 90s, you went on a pilgrimage in Nepal and you had this question within of how to bring protection and healing to the earth, what to do. So will you share who you met and their advice? Let's start there. Sure. And anything else you want to say? Oh, yeah. No, thank you so much, Olivia. And I just appreciate so much the the depth of connection that we share and, and the opportunity to talk with you about it all. Yeah, I met, I was invited to go to Nepal, to a remote corner of Nepal back in 1990 and had the chance to meet an old Lama who lived in a cave. I was told at the time he was 106 years old and it impacted me tremendously. And then it was actually in the writing of the book, nearing the very end of the writing of the book that I learned that he actually was not 106 years old at the time. I don't know how that all happened, but you know, he was in his 90s, which is pretty, pretty good. But in any case, um, it was an old Lama and he lived in retreat in in this cave and in, in, in the end of his life and, and had spent time there throughout his life. Very prominent old hermit, really, you know, who was a great teacher to one of my teachers, Lama Sultram, uh, Nawang Sultram Zongpo, who, who, who I can talk about later. But anyway, I was taken to meet this old Lama. And it was as I was walking up the path to meet him that I realized, oh my goodness, I have this amazing, you know, opportunity of a lifetime to literally ask a question of the old wise man in the cave. And um, I, I didn't know what I would do with that opportunity until uh, I had reflected on it very deeply walking up the high mountains and uh, came to the decision to ask him, what can we do to bring healing and protection to the earth? Mm -hmm. And so that was my question. And, you know, I'm still guided by that question to this day. And then tell me, what was his answer? Well, his answer, 
you know, it, at first he said, even just one person can make a difference in the whole area around where they live if they're practicing deeply and dedicated to benefiting others. But then he said, but you, and he pointed at me, he, you know, could barely see he was, he only had a year left to live after I met him. And, uh, but he, he looked at me and he said, you need to get these earth treasure vases and you need to put them in the ground and they will do that work. And I didn't know what that even was at that time, but I learned that these are clay pots that are filled with symbolic offerings, offerings symbolic of bringing healing and protection to the earth and consecrated through prayers and practice to really hold our intentions for healing in an area. And that, that when they're planted in the ground, the prayers and the offerings are said to do that work, mm -hmm. you know, and this is a traditional Tibetan Buddhist practice that is carried out all across the Himalayan region, but done so kind of quietly behind the scenes, you know, it's not a front and center practice, particularly. And when I first heard about it, I thought, right, how's a little clay pot filled with prayers and symbolic offerings going to deal with the issues that we're dealing with today. But I also had to admit that I have a lot of respect for this particular tradition and the teachings of Tibetan Buddhism. And, you know, we got to start somewhere and this is what's coming to me. And so, okay, where do I get some, you know? <laughs> and so that put me on the path. And I've just been amazed at what it has, what this practice has facilitated in my life and in, in the lives of so many people around the world where I've gone. And that's what my book is all about. Do you want to share the roots of the practice, the Terama tradition, and where it births from? Mm. It's a really beautiful, interesting, and maybe in some places in the world a little bit uh, controversial, you know, the Terma tradition which terma is a word for treasure, and <clears throat> it refers to the fact that when Buddhism was brought to Tibet through the historical figure known as Guru Rinpoche or Padma Sambhava, that this was in the eighth century, he came from India into Tibet and was this realized teacher who saw many things about what was going to be needed in the future and real, realized that um, certain practices would be um, very beneficial in future times. And so he, he and his consort, um, Yeshe Sogal, uh, who was very much a part of this Terma tradition, they, he brought through these teachings and these practices, but then they hid them in space and time sometimes they hid them in physical locations to be discovered later and sometimes they hid them in the mind streams of other great masters to be revealed at a later time again when they were needed and so that discovery process is a really interesting part of tibetan buddhism in the nyingma lineage the old school of tibetan buddhism and so there's a lot of wonderful stories about um, lamas and, and masters, great masters who go into, they're guided to go to some rocky outcropping and pull a statue out of a cave that is carrying this terma or, you know, pulling things out of bodies of water is another, another place in which sometimes termas are revealed. And a lot of them come through deep practice or dreams where someone who has been, you know, steeped in the teachings and the lineage teachings will have a kind of breakthrough and see a practice come forward in their mind stream. I have a story, I think I tell it in my book of one of my teachers, um, Nam Kai Norbu Rinpoche, who revealed a term in our lifetimes. He's no longer living, but this was back in, I wanna say either late eighties or, or 
I guess it was in the late eighties in Nepal, he, he revealed a, a, a term that came to him as a dream and he saw it written. And if I, I wasn't there, but I, I heard the story and I believe that he saw it almost like written in language in the Dakini language in the sky. And he, he transcribed that basically into a notebook as exactly as it had come to him. And, and then a couple of days later, he transcribed it again, just to make sure that it was sort of authentic. And the only difference was in a few words that had the same meaning, you know, how there's a couple of words that mean the same thing. So that was the difference in how it was transcribed by him. The practice of the earth treasure vases is one of these termas that was initiated back at the time of Guru Rinpoche, but then was hidden and brought forward again, or brought forward, I guess, I, I'm, I'm sort of struggling with the language here, but during, during our times and starting in sort of the, I think it was the um, industrial revolution, when it first started coming forward through the Tibetans and then in, in more recent times, a number of lineages of, of Tibetan Buddhism have focused more directly on the treasure vase practice because of what's happening to the earth and because of the intense imbalances seen in the world. And it's said to, ha to restore balance, to restore harmony in the area around where they are placed. And you know, bring healing and protection in all the ways that are called for. So that was the practice I was given. And when I, when I was given it, I was talking to the lamas that I met at that time about things like radioactive waste coming off the production of nuclear weapons here at, in, in New Mexico. And now we have global climate change and such serious issues. Of course, there's issues of war and pandemics and, you know, just so much, so much that we have to restore the balance around. And I, I brought that to them, you know, and they recognized that where I was coming from was pretty extraordinary. I mean, the times are, are extraordinary, these dregs of time that we're living in now. And so they gathered <clears throat> relics and medicines and offerings from all the lineages of living lamas at the time, this was back in 1990, and mixed that into the clay. And then they consecrated the pots that were made especially for us. And, and then they gave them to us empty. Normally the lamas would fill the pots themselves with particular offerings that have been designated, you know, through the, the lineage teachings. But in our case, because once the pots are filled and sealed, they're not to be opened. And they were concerned since they had to travel from Nepal all the way to New Mexico about customs <laughs> and security and all of the things that, uh, you know, raise questions by the powers that be. So they gave them to us empty. They consecrated them. They, they put all kinds of potent medicines into the clay but they gave them to us to fill and then to seal and then to bury. And they told me, you know, just put them in the ground. They'll do the work. And my, my rational mind was pretty overwhelmed <laughs> because I didn't understand how it could possibly work. But this is a, about going beyond what we think we know and into these much larger realms where all kinds of things are possible. <laughs> mm. And and I didn't mention the name of the Lamas, Charak Rinpoche. The, his, his formal name is Kushuk Mangdun. And he was known as Charak Rinpoche because where he lived is called Charak. And that's typically what often happens is that a Lama is associated with his location. Liberia was one place that you buried a uh, treasure vase. And in your book, before you even share about that, you mention the 14-year civil war and what actually helped end that war. And I, I wanted actually for you to share that story because it seems so mundane, but it's actually, you know, the women coming together, it seems so mundane, and but it's so relatable and, and I think would give a listener 
hope of things we can actually do during these continued war times. Would you be willing to start us off there sharing that story? Yeah, so the 14 year civil war in Liberia was ended by the women. They had just had it, you know, it was going on and on and it was terrible war. And they um, came together and it was initiated by uh, a woman named Lema Bowie, who actually won the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for her efforts. She shared the, the prize that year with the woman that became the president of Liberia, Ellen uh, Johnson Sirleaf, first woman, democratically elected woman of any country in Africa who was elected out after the war ended. And they shared it with another woman whose name escapes me in the moment from Yemen. So it was kind of a triple packed Nobel Prize. But in any case, Lima Bowie is a Christian woman activist who invited her Muslim sisters to join with her, her Christian sisters to, to, to really demonstrate enough is enough. And this, this action that they did was told very beautifully in a film called Pray the Devil Back to Hell. It's a film, a documentary film by a woman named Abby Disney, I think granddaughter of Walt Disney, who's a really wonderful filmmaker herself. And it's a film worth watching because it tells the whole story. But the women went out on the streets. Normally they might not come together so much, but they came together and joined forces. They dressed all in white. They went out on the streets. They sang, they fasted. They refused to cook and do the laundry and have sex with their husbands and you know all of that they were just like that's it and men did join them and they just would not give up and it went on for a while but they ended up succeeding there were quote unquote peace talks which were really all the men the warlords the so-called leaders who were talking about having peace but not really getting there and the women just went in and said we we won't let this keep going so in a nutshell that's the story and it's an incredible inspiration to me and could be to so many of us in the in these times something's got to change this is not working we have today gaza we have ukraine we have yemen sudan there's just endless places where it continues in ways that need to stop. And unfortunately, Liberia is a very, very complicated place and it's still conflicted. Ellen Johnson Sirleaf served two terms as president, but that her term expired after two terms. And so then there's been other things going on there. And we have to have so much vigilance, right? Vigilance and commitment to the long term. But I feel like we're in the midst of of a big, big change now. And that, you know, while things are very bleak, there are also signs that things are really changing because we can't keep going down this same old path. It's not going anywhere anymore. I also wanted to see if you'd speak about General Leopard, mm -hmm. also known as Christian Bethelson, who you speak of many times in the book and who you met in Liberia. And mm -hmm. he requested that you teach him meditation. Will you speak about the way of meditation that that helped him? Because he has such severe PTSD. I think that would also allow anyone to feel like there is a pathway forward for so many of us, even if we don't feel like there is. Like he's such an amazing example of that. When I went to Liberia, before I went, I, I was invited by a group that included a, a writer and teacher I have studied with named Dina Metzger, who was part of a group called the Everyday Gandhis that did a lot of peace building work in Liberia post civil war. And it was through them that I was invited to go there. And they had a gathering that brought together a lot of Americans and Liberians here in the United States, which is where I came to bring the treasure vase practice. And it's there that I met Christian Bethelson and he was working with them, learning peace building after his whole adult life being a, a soldier and a, a rebel leader, General Leopard. And when I met him, I rang the bell. 
out of Thich Nhat Hanh's tradition, we invite the bell at the beginning of any meditation. And I was leading this meditation around the treasure base practice and rang the bell. And afterwards he came up to me and he said, the sound of the bell really woke him up. And he asked me to teach him to meditate. And he was quite aggressive in his demeanor. You know, I was a little like, ooh, I don't know, you know, who is this guy? And I spoke to him, but I didn't think he was serious. And he began to call me. And then when I went to Liberia a year later to take the treasure vase there, he was there and he was part of the group that assisted with that process. And I I actually formed a very, very deep and long-term relationship with him because I realized he was serious and he did want to know how to meditate. And so I began to work with him. And I realized when I went to Liberia that the the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh were were really appropriate for that country because, of course, Thich Nhat Hanh came out of the Vietnam War and his teachings were developed or applied, you know, the teachings of engaged Buddhism were really generated out of his experience in the war. And so then when I went to Liberia, I saw the parallel and I also saw how people who have lived through war and and the losses of war are so damaged for such a long time. And that the practice of mindfulness, the very simple practice of returning to the breath and the present moment is a very effective way of bringing healing in those situations very simple, you know, because you can't get too complicated. It's very basic, but the breath is such a anchor for the mind with a mind that is triggered and reactive to come back to that place of what we call calm abiding, you know, present moment, only moment, you know, just come back over and over again. And that's the main teaching is just to set aside all those thoughts and feelings for a little bit and then come back and just breathe in and out deep and slow to come back over and over again to what is happening right here and right now and slowly slowly that facilitates the capacity to be able to notice the blue sky as Thich Nhat Hanh would say, see the smile on the children's faces, smell the the flowers blooming and return to what is so beautiful about life. And, and that I have witnessed in Bethelson, a person who was conditioned by the gun and by the commands of the officers that he served and then later he became a general himself, there was so much violence in his life. And that was really all he knew. His training was to kill. But underneath that, I discovered someone who was yearning for a different life, you know, for a different way of being. And that's why he was so insistent. He wanted to to learn meditation. When he went to Plum Village, Thich Nhat Hanh's community and, and met Thai before he had his stroke and received teachings and then lived there off and on for three years, others people were struck by how quickly, and, and so was I, how quickly he responded and also integrated the teachings of the Dharma in this very basic way. It, it, it was like he was so ripe for mm-hmm. that, but he had to go through a long process of transformation because he was very reactive, very aggressive, and he had all this PTSD, as we've, we've mentioned, you know, coming from years and years and years of, of war. And so to could just over and over and over again. And, you know, Bethelson would say when he was at Plum Village, he said, this is heaven on earth, this place. He, 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 he lived in a, in a world where the sound of the gun was constant, you know, and later the pandemic, people dying constantly all around him all the time and people being killed. And I mean, it's just unthinkable, really. And so for him to come to a place like Plum Village that is so peaceful and so simple 
was literally like entering heaven on earth. And I always say, like, if if a person like he, Christian Bethelson can transform in the way that he has, anything is possible, you know. And mm-hmm. I hope I hope he will tell his story himself one day. And I'm encouraging him to do that. Oh, I hope he does as well. Yeah. And thinking of him and you and Thich Nhat Hanh and some of the other people you've spoken of, I I'm, I'm want to talk about the topic of forgiveness and this fierce compassion. That seems to really be something through your book, how important it is. And of course, with the travesties of the destruction of the earth, the amount of rape that happens in the world and abuse and and all of these things. And what does that look like to you when you think of fierce compassion and forgiveness? Have you learned there's a place when it's ripe for forgiveness, where it's ripe for fierce compassion to invite that in? What does it look like? You know, that's such a hard one because sometimes it takes years. It just takes years to find that place where we can forgive. It doesn't mean bypassing or overlooking the damage that has been done. I think we, in time, we get to that place of realizing that carrying that vengeance, say, you know, it just is, it's not really going to help. But we have to find that place within us. And somebody like Nema Namadamu in Congo was a great example of this for me, because, you know, there was a story I tell in the book about her daughter being attacked by these guys. They talk about Congo as being the rape capital of the world. And it's a tool that is used against women in that country and in the world, all over the world. And I'm sort of branching around here a little bit, but the parallel between the rape of women and the rape of the earth has been one of the real core wounds that I have needed to reckon with in this practice of bringing healing to the earth, if we're talking about bringing healing to the earth, there are certain things that really need to be addressed that are not okay. And rape is one of them. So Nema realized that she had to go talk to these guys. And she did. And she said, you know, I'm your mother. You need to listen to me. You can't behave like this. And and they started crying and begging for her to be their friend, you know, like they're so desperate for the kind of loving kindness that a mother would give them. They, it's like Bethelson, years and years and years of being in the army, you just lose touch with what is life-giving. And so to have someone come forward and say, you are loved, you are forgiven. Now, now come on and be a good person. <laughs> but at the same time, doing so with with kindness. I was so struck by that. I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it's it's complicated. For myself, I've had to really go through a lot around certain things that have happened to me in my life in order to get to that place of forgiveness. And there's just such a fine line between letting go and also holding people accountable and part of being a holy vessel is holding all of it holding the beauty and the terror we have to have the capacity to and especially like in in this country united states where things and in the world things are so polarized so you know holding ourselves and holding each other through that extreme polarization and going down the middle. We talk about the middle path in Buddhism, going down the middle, not grasping onto or identifying with either side. This is the key. A huge piece of your path so far too has been finally allowing yourself to take refuge in the earth without needing confirmation. And I actually just wanna read this quotation that you share from Thich Nhat Hanh that feels so important from the Love Letter to the Earth, published in 2013. When you're able to see the earth for the bodhisattva that she is, you will want to bow down and touch the earth with reverence and respect. Then love and care will be born in your heart. This awakening is enlightenment. 
Don't look for enlightenment elsewhere. This awakening, this enlightenment will bring a great transformation in you and you'll have more happiness, more love and more understanding than from any other practice. Mm -hmm. I also want to talk about when the Buddha becomes enlightened, the Buddha touches the earth as his witness. And I want to hear from you, what does this mean? How did the Buddha see the earth in this moment? Mm. <laughs> I found it so interesting and significant that the Buddha actually touched the earth in the moment, this is how the story goes, uh, the moment of his awakening. He was, you know, being cha challenged by a figure known as Mara, like, who are you? What do you think you're doing? You can't be enlightened, you know, like all those kind of voices that we all have, because, of course, Buddha nature is something everyone has. It just means that part of us that is wise and awakened. And all we have to do is, you know, access that through and meditation is a very good way of doing so so is nature so is being out in the woods or by the ocean or climbing a mountain or you know these these ways in which we connect with our true nature so in that moment the buddha was having this incredible awakening process and at that moment he touched the earth he summoned the earth to witness what was happening And when he did that, the story goes that it's just like everything stopped and the earth came forward to validate his experience. And there's all stories and these are also in the book, stories about how the earth goddess was seen at that time back in the Buddha's time. And how I, one of the things that I love is that Prativi, she's the name of the goddess, she mother earth she gave her lap to the worthy those who are worthy of sitting in her lap to wake up and so in any case i feel as if i have really come to to value and to see and to form a relationship with gaia with the earth as such a reliable source of refuge as we speak about in Buddhism, that it's sort of the ultimate refuge because we are not actually separate from Mother Earth. We are part of the web of life, each and every single one of us in our own way, you know, and we're part of the trees and the rivers and the birds and, and, and the flowers and all that is, it is all connected. And so to find ourselves in the family of things, as Wendell Berry said, and to summon the earth. In the book, I also talk about the fact that I think I was summoned by the earth, you know, that the earth has become this living being for me very vividly through this process of, of carrying out this practice of answering the summons that many of us are now hearing because there is such a need for healing in the world and the fabric of life is really quite threatened. So there's a, an urgency about it, but also not to get caught in the pressure because that is not going to serve. When we act from that place of pressure, it's part of the old story actually it's part of what got us into this mess and our indigenous elders all around the world will tell us we need to stop and take a breath reorient so the earth teaches us this and when we when we touch the earth when each of us touches the earth we come back to ourselves and that's what happened with the buddha I would actually love if you would read from your book for a moment. All right. So this is, this is a chapter called Becoming a Holy Vessel. I was beginning to understand that if we want to be a holy vessel and contribute to the healing of our world, it is vitally important that we cultivate the ground of our being and plant new seeds. The soil is depleted. Life is out of balance. Once these seeds have been planted, they need to be watered. 
they do not grow into nourishing fruit overnight. So we cultivate the ground of our being and we wait. We know that if we disperse the energy of transformation too soon, we will not reap the benefits. We learn to trust the process and like a vase to contain the new energies we are cultivating. Acting too quickly, we risk perpetuating the same old stories. And even if we've had a great idea and can't wait to jump on it, we still wait until we are certain we have come to inhabit utterly new ground. Everything in our lives tells us we have to do it now. And now arrives quicker than ever as time speeds up faster and faster. But if we want to offer something truly new, if we want to really be of service, then taking another breath and allowing the energy to build within ourselves until we are aware of embodying a whole new operating system. Then we are assured that our actions will be contributing to the healing of the world. As we give over to this process of transformation and awakening, a certain ease dawns and a new sense of creative flow naturally comes into our lives. This is when we realize we are becoming a holy vessel. It's not about me any longer. It's about being so full, we contain the whole web of life and all possibilities. We are truly empty of a separate self in those moments. From here, our actions flow in response to what is arising around us. And we know with confidence we have arrived. In spite of the conditioning that tells us we have to do, 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 we actually don't have to do it all right now. We can stop and ask ourselves, what is skillful action? Can I wait for the right moment? Not just for others, but for myself. <clears throat> can I trust that I will know when the right moment arrives? Because certainly to be a holy vessel, a good container, we simply must care for ourselves. Many of us can barely remember how to listen to our own needs. We are so busy that we neglect and ignore our vessel at the expense of our well being. And our world reflects this. Many of us have become such strivers that we have sacrificed ourselves on the altar of the patriarchy over and over again. We have worked ourselves to the bone, to the point of collapse trying hard to make a difference, telling ourselves, maybe if I just keep going, maybe if I just sacrifice my own needs one more time, maybe this time it will be different. I know I'm not the only one who struggles with the feeling of not being good enough, smart enough, or successful enough. We strive to be successful and powerful, yet we're dismissed and told to be less threatening. Society tells us to be beautiful and sexy, yet we are raped and abused for our beauty and our sexuality. How many atrocities must we live through before we can stop trying to be something other than what we are, stop fitting ourselves into an unattainable image of perfection, before we can relax into safety and do what comes naturally. Now, as the earth screams for our attention, we must reclaim our miraculous, powerful, true nature inseparable from her. So will you tell me your experience about steeping? And it seems like the Gaia mantra, for instance, which we haven't spoken about, has emerged from exactly what you're speaking of, the steeping and waiting for the readiness well, it's such an important thing to, to learn for all of us, you know, to not push, to not force things, to not try to make things happen, because that's also part of that, that same old dynamic that is just destroying the world, really. And so on the path of practice, I've really had to learn with the treasure vases that everything has its own time. And I might think I know what needs to happen next, but the treasure vases have their own agenda and their own sense of time. And, and I've really had to learn to wait 
not to lose the thread or miss the moment because we have to be very aware and awake to recognize the signs when they arise that it's time to act but it's amazing how things unfold in ways that we could never have imagined or planned if we had done it ourselves but if we open to something larger than ourselves and align ourselves and this is why aligning with mother earth is so helpful because there's all the the seasons for example you know there's a season for everything and the the cycles of the sun and the moon you know these are our natural cycles and ways in which we can live our lives and so we get all excited you know but just taking that other breath and coming back to just what's here right now knowing that if we have this intention if we have this prayer if we have this direction that has been seated it will come about guaranteed so i have definitely learned that along the way and the gaia mantra and the practice that i teach now of the sublime mother gaia was an example of that for sure i was carrying out the treasure vases all around the world and i kept feeling like the practices that i was doing namely the practice of tara which is has been a wonderful support for me in in many ways still i wanted to have this personal feeling of connection to gaia that really this was where my focus was and is and also what i feel the times are calling for and so I was asking for that, but I didn't know how it was going to come. And then one day I was in retreat actually, and I was practicing deeply and the mantra, the mantra came to me. It was just, it was just kaboom. And I was kind of shocked really. And, and then I began to see how the practice that I was doing of Tara could be modified the language could be modified to be an expression of an invitation to come into relationship with Gaia and to have this mantra that expresses her nature that we can recite as a way of forming that connection. And so I began to unfold this practice within myself. I spoke to some of the lamas that I'm connected to, and they were always like, mm, yeah, mm-hmm, okay. You need to do that for a long time before you start sharing it. And I was aware and still am aware that, that there are very specific ways in which practices are given in this tradition. And I was kind of going out on a limb. I felt like I, I wasn't exactly authorized. It came to me. And this is where the path led me, you know, and I have been concerned that I would be criticized about this practice. So I, I kept it inside. And meanwhile, certain kinds of for me, I feel are outdated ways of passing on the Dharma within particularly the Tibetan lineages feel need of reform and change. I just was reckoning with a lot of issues around where do we go from here? Because I feel as if the times are really calling for more of a collective awakening in relationship to the earth and each other in a way that is not always being addressed directly when the focus is on ourselves. I had to claim that. And it took falling off the mountain, which is, as I describe in a chapter called Head Over Heels. <laughs> I, I took a fall and I was in this process of reckoning when I fell. The Lama that I was traveling with said, oh, it must have been Tara that saved you or the Buddha or Padmasambhava, you know. And I, I didn't have that experience. I realized that it was the earth who caught me, literally, you know, just like the ground beneath me stopped me from dying in that moment. 
And I had to, out of that, I had to stand up for the new path that I, I came on after that that was not a path that I had been on before, if that makes sense. And so I began to teach the practice, given what's happening in our times and the need for, for many of us to form that connection and listen to the teachings from the earth, the teachings, this great teacher that we have and, and the community that we are part of that is the web of life. So that's my focus now. Mm. And I still kind of brace myself for the reaction that may come from the tradition, the tradition that I love and respect and honor, but which I also feel I'm called in a little bit different way. I'm summoned in a, in a different way. And I, I draw from those teachings and I'm grateful. I'm, I'm grateful to all of my teachers, how deeply this, this tradition has informed me, but we're all in this together now and, and we've got to listen to the earth. There's a little thread in the book too, that I don't know if you, you remember this about standing up sausage. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, Your teacher. I, yeah, my teacher, Gyalto Rinpoche, would call me sausage. And I never quite knew why he called me sausage, but for some reason he called me sausage and he would tell me to stand up sausage. And, and it was so funny, you know. And then finally I realized, yeah, okay, it's time for me to stand up for, for all of this. It was just like a core teaching. <laughs> he seemed to have a lot of good core teachings that were alternative. Like even about tear toms, you said like how... He was like, everybody is, if they have a memory of this, everybody is a treasure revealer. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to see, would you want to read? We can end on a paragraph from your book. From yeah, please. Chapter. This is the chapter from Sacred Activism. Engaged Buddhism asks us to live in such a way that every step, every breath is a meditation, a prayer for the world. We engage each activity, no matter how small, as if it were benefiting others, living every aspect of our lives in service and with mindfulness. This is not to say we sacrifice ourselves and override our own needs, because self and other are two sides of the same coin. What truly benefits me also benefits you. The trick is knowing what is truly beneficial, what will really serve us, in any given moment. The goal of individual enlightenment is no longer the main focus. Instead, I am excited about the great adventure of a collective awakening. I thrill at the prospect that together we may realize our commitment to the liberation of all beings and usher in a time when the relative and absolute realities are integrated in compassionate awareness. Out of the field of our shared intentions for life on earth, what will be revealed as we embody the healing solutions that arise from the experience of we? The implications of a collective awakening are shattering to our sense of individuality. Our identification with a separate sense of self will no longer be the organizing principle for life on earth. Our evolution as a species and as a planetary culture depends not only on our realization of this, but our embodiment of it. Living our lives in a profoundly transformed way and connecting our communities in service to Mother Earth is where hope can be found. <laughs>